Hey everyone, my name is Harry Bell. Welcome to a real talk about the power of language and how we use it. I'm hoping in the next few minutes to spark a little debate, maybe ruffle a few feathers, but really generally just to bring to light a few ideas I think are important, very important to talk about. History has been filled with all kinds of language to describe people, experiences, and objects using labels that in reality can be quite disturbing as we look back at them today. In fact, in their origin, some language labels were intentionally explicit and were often created to ridicule or dehumanize individuals or entire cultures. This sometimes happened because of fear and ignorance, but most often extreme language like this has been a reflection of deep-seated hatred between one person or a group of people and another. It is natural for language to change over time. We sometimes forget or maybe simply don't know the offensive origins of certain words and phrases. Some examples are simply no longer appropriate to even mention and thankfully we've moved so far beyond using them that we no longer need to argue over whether we can or not. Other examples are clearly inappropriate but we still hear people use them all the time, sometimes, most often, without even thinking about their impact on the people who would hear or see them. Think about this. When I was in high school, and here's me with my high tech, this was known as a ghetto blaster. This language label made all sorts of assumptions about the type of people who might live in a ghetto and the type of people who would use a machine just like this. The label was quite obviously racially and socially stereotyping a certain group of people. I do remember someone told me about it and suddenly it was like a light bulb went off and I realized how judgmental and negative the word was. Now thankfully that type of machine became known as a boom box. How about this expression? Low man on the totem pole. This is still used with a negative meaning that Whoever this person might be, he or she must not be all that important because, of course, it's at the bottom. Well, the reality is that totem poles and in indigenous cultures from around the world are quite sacred. The figures on a totem pole can represent stories, family values, important events. And the idea that someone at the bottom is not important, well, that that person must strive to be on top, it, it doesn't really honor that in some cultures being low on the totem pole is actually a higher honor than being on top. Now think about that. Without the strength and stability at the bottom, the top could never possibly soar as high as it does. A different way of looking at it, yes? No comments from the peanut gallery is probably not that well known to you younger people out there, but I've noticed it popping up in newspaper panels, like in the comics and editorials in the past while, and it's usually making a reference to some political nonsense happening in the world. At one time, trying to be witty, because I like to be witty, I used to tell people that I liked my own ideas best, and I would say, now no comments from the peanut gallery. I always used the expression as a joke, and never really meant anything by it, but what I didn't know was that it probably originates from the days of vaudeville theatre, when the cheapest seats, furthest away from the stage, were reserved for the poorest of poor. They weren't good seats. The peanut gallery was known for being cramped, hot, dirty, because all the peanut shells were never swept up, and especially unsafe for women who were out on their own. And there's no humor in that. But isn't it interesting how the expression has become an acceptable part, or at least became an acceptable part of everyday language for people of my generation? These few examples represent the darker side of language labels, but there are a couple that I think are used so often we don't even realize the potential for them to make us think one group of individuals could be better or more important than another. Take this for example. Here is a bunch of young people, all of whom might be referred to as you guys. Guys, we use the word all the time. Hey, you guys, get to work. Great presentation, you guys. You guys, pay attention. But here's the clinch. Unless a room is completely full of boys, there will be at least one person who is not a boy. And despite our usage of guys to mean everyone, it's actually still a male reference to a fellow and makes it sound like being a girl perhaps is second best. Would you ever think of calling an entire room of people girls if there was a guy in the room? Well, no. Then why do we think it's appropriate to call an entire room with boys and girls in it? guys. Here's another one. For almost my entire career, 
there has been a reference to kindergarten to grade 8 schools being the feeder schools to a particular high school. Now in everyday conversation, adults especially will talk about which feeder school has this or that. But think about that. Feeder. Does that make you think at all that maybe this relationship is kind of dangerous? Maybe that again the main goal should be to get to the high school. So, so what? So you can be eaten in some way? Now, are high schools meant to be predators, like a shark, ready to devour its prey? I don't think so. But with that one word, an idea of I'm bigger and better than you are, could possibly be created. Okay, so I've been rambling on, but I think you get the picture. Language is important. It's a way of identifying oneself in a culture or society. It can build people up, it can tear people down, it can single people out, or it can bring people together. I'd like you to think about the power of your own language. Are there traps that you get caught up in without even thinking about it? And my challenge to you is this. Think about ways of making language inclusive. My hope is that you will especially rethink your use of the word guys. Like what other words could you use that would make the message equal for everyone? And instead of feeder schools, what about partner schools? Supporting the idea that all schools work together to make experiences the best for kids. And what an opportunity to build strength. What do you think? Are you up to the challenge? Thanks for watching this Real Talk. I'm Harry Bell. Don't forget to check out all the other Real Talks available on the Real Talks for Action YouTube channel. You might get inspired to do one of your own. My fingers are crossed.